G'day, I'm Mick Hfield. You can call me H. I've been around the oil and gas industry nearly 30 years. Left school at 17, got myself an electrical apprenticeship and got a job on an offshore platform in 85. I've pretty much seen it all. The highs, the lows, the good, the bad. Good people, great people, and some people I'd rather forget. I've seen minor accidents and near misses by the dozen, and it's made me incredibly vigilant on the job. Personal safety is really important, but there's one thing that keeps me focused on my job, and that's process safety. Because process safety failure is what leads to catastrophic incidents. They might be rare, but they're devastating when they happen. Every year, there are literally tens of thousands of potential process safety failures. And thousands of failures do occur, resulting in hundreds of process safety incidents, and sometimes these can be catastrophic. You know, back in the day, process safety was seen as the role of risk engineers and so-called experts who used to roll out all sorts of technical mumbo-jumbo and complex jargon which never meant anything to me and it still doesn't. As it turns out, it's not actually the case. I mean, if you think about it, the safety manager isn't directly responsible for you working safely. You are. He or she is there to make sure that the best systems and processes are available for you to do your job safely. But ultimately, everyone in an organisation has a role to play in process safety. So what is process safety? I mean, you hear the expression all the time, and for a long time I just thought it was all about following rules and procedures, you know, follow the process. But that's not what it is at all. Let me try to explain. Process safety is all about the barriers that are put in place to keep our facilities safe and our products in the pipes. Now these barriers can be people, process or plant related, and the bigger the potential hazard is, the more barriers are put in place. You know, when we manage personal safety, we put barriers in place all the time to keep people away from harm so no one gets hurt. And the idea is similar with process safety, except we put barriers in place to keep our products in the pipe. So in our industry, we can look at a hierarchy of barriers. The best barrier might be elimination. That is, design out the hazard or remove it completely. The next best barrier is substitution, where we substitute the hazardous item for a less hazardous one. You can then introduce engineering barriers such as isolation or guarding. These are great, but they still rely on human skill and dependable parts. Then there are administrative barriers, things like training and scheduling. Of course, these barriers rely on people actually following procedures, which doesn't always happen. So it's a less effective control. And the absolute last resort, the final barrier, which we'd rather not rely on at all, is our PPE, our protective clothing. If all other controls were completely 100% effective, these wouldn't be necessary. So these are our barriers, but barriers aren't perfect. Ideally, each of these barriers would be rock solid and impenetrable like a brick wall. Nothing gets through it, that's that, everyone's safe. But we know from experience that barriers aren't rock solid. They have holes in them. Procedures aren't always followed. Parts can be faulty, corrosion occurs, design mistakes can be made. So the brick wall, our ideal solid barrier, ends up looking more like a slice of Swiss cheese. In our industry, we're working in a risky environment. We work with hydrocarbons and hydrocarbons can be deadly. You don't want to release them, and you certainly don't want them ignited. Fortunately, there are numerous barriers separating the gas from an ignition source. This looks pretty good, until you remember that barriers aren't always perfect, and they have holes in them. The idea is we want the holes to be as small as possible and avoid these holes lining up. Because when the barriers break down and the holes line up, this could be catastrophic. All right, well, that was a nice little piece of animation, wasn't it? You might have seen something like that before. And ideally, that would be that. You'd walk away thinking about barriers and Swiss cheese for a day or two and then forget it. Well, here's what a hydrocarbon release looks like in real life at a gas facility captured by CCTV. See this guy here? He's just going to work like every other day. Well, his day's about to change. 
badly. You don't forget that, Nari. So process safety, keeping the hydrocarbons in the pipes is something we need to get our heads around. It's the most important part of our day-to-day -day jobs. And speaking of day-to-day -day jobs, I want to tell you a little story about what happened at my workplace. It'll only take a few minutes. Check this out. Look, we need to focus our attention on the Rainbow Onshore gas plant. It's our new startup project and it's where the future profitability of the company lies. I just don't think we should be cutting corners on the South Birdman platform maintenance shutdown. Well, we have to cut somewhere and we're still performing the essential maintenance. So we move a few personnel. It's earmarked for decommissioning anyway. Well, this is a win-win situation. We transfer our skilled workers as soon as possible to Rainbow, get production up to speed, and then we don't have to make redundancies. I can see how it makes sense on paper. I'm just concerned that South Birdman will end up with too few workers with too much responsibility. Look, the bottom line is we need to focus on Rainbow. It's our flagship project. Every day that we don't have full production there, we're losing $3.3 million in revenue. Well, is Ross handling the transfer? He's on it now. Hi, Ross. Hey, Lisa. How's it looking? Well, there's been big cutbacks. It worries me a bit. Why? Well, there's this hurry to get Rainbow up to full production. Not that I blame them for that, but I feel we're neglecting the shutdown of South Birdman. I mean, there's still a lot to do. You know, those old rigs, they require more maintenance, not less. We have more than 12 months' work ahead of us, and what, we're being forced to lose some engineering personnel? So the shutdown will take longer? Uh, it's not that so much. It, it's more, we'll have fewer people, so we won't be able to undertake the full scope of work. Uh, for example, we're, we're losing the corrosion inspection program. Those guys are going over to Rainbow. But South Birdman has been operating for 15 years without incident. It's the best performing platform we've ever had. I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm sure it will be too. But you know what I'm like. I, I want to do things by the book. Well, we still have engineers to undergo the inspections, right? Well, actually, we're back to so-called essential only maintenance. Well, I guess what's done is done. Right. So, the budget's been cut. Engineers are removed from an important shutdown to a more important, well, more profitable start-up. That sounds to me like some holes are forming in one of our barriers. Luckily for us, there are plenty of other barriers. But remember, no barrier is necessarily perfect. We wouldn't want holes forming in those others. Ross! Brilliant job on the personnel transfers. Rainbow's at full speed now. Everything's running so smoothly. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I, I couldn't be happier, and your hard efforts haven't gone unnoticed, let me assure you. Great job. Uh, Brilliant work. Thank you, Anne. Good news? Uh, sort of. Anne's happy that things are up and running at full capacity at Rainbow, but I have my doubts about cutting the South Birdman maintenance team back to Skeleton Crew. If anything, we should be putting more resources into the shutdown. Well, what does Anne say? I didn't get the chance to bring it up. Why not? Oh, well, you know, she was happy and raving and oh, I didn't want to spoil the party. Well, everything's going to be OK, right? Probably. Things are getting hectic, though. This is ridiculous, Greg. We've got work requests coming out of our ears. I know, Leon. Look, pile of requests, half-finished sketches and no one to do the job. Well, we're just going to have to deal with it. Well, half the blokes I sent to Rainbow, the ones who were meant to be doing these reviews and signing these authorizations. Look, there was a lot of pressure to get the Rainbow plant up to full production. And yes, we've got a lot of work to do, no doubt about it. But we can handle it. Yeah, but what if we get We that? can handle it, can't we, Leon? Look, what's the point in complaining? They're not going to change their mind. We, we just have to deal with it. Yeah, but we're not doing the job properly because there's no end point. Look, just push through all the small jobs. We'll meet our KPIs and worry about any problems at the end of the month. Yeah, but who's going to sign that off? Look, this one, for example, this corrosion report. Who's going to give this authorization because we haven't got any corrosion experts because they've all been transferred? OK. How about this? Call up Keith Harrington and Dino at the Rainbow plant. Run it by them, get their verbal okay, and then 
It's on off on their behalf. Yeah, but we can't do that, can we? Because they haven't seen it. You just said we don't know how we're going to get these things signed off. I'm telling you. Explain it to them over the phone. Get their verbal okay. Once all the signatures and forms are in place, push them all through. Job done. How else are we going to do it? Well, that doesn't look good. There's no real engineering process review being carried out. It's all about rubber stamping and pushing through the small jobs to meet KPI targets. I mean, they're under-resourced, but that's no excuse to cut corners. Looks to me like transferring people is another barrier, developing some serious holes, and, and some don't see it. Two down. There are more barriers remaining, but I wouldn't want any of the others to fail. Baza. Hey, Trev. You got a minute? Soon. I've got to get this corrosion report into the database. Well, they really need you, mate. Yeah, it'll have to wait, Trev. I got this report. The chopper's coming in 45 and I'm on it. My back-to-back -back John is coming in the south. I've got to finish up. Jeez, you put that report in? You know how much work that's going to make for us? Yeah, it can't be helped, Trev. How else are the planners going to know what it needs doing? I don't know why you bother. This place is getting decommissioned. In three years, it won't even exist. What is it you wanted? They really need you in the control room. Lonely, take a sec. Yeah, all right. Hi, uh, Barry. Look, I know you said we've got to push some of these small jobs through, but we've just received a list of jobs to be completed, all with really quick completion dates. Um, who's doing the JSAs and the rest of the work, Pat? Show me the list. Look, all small jobs, routine stuff, nothing to it. We'll get through them. But it just seems like they've been rushed out to us. A, a lot of these jobs have no detailed drawings, material specs or anything really. Well, that's become the norm now, hasn't it? When's the last time you saw a well-developed work pack since we got scheduled for decommissioning? Anyway, more of these jobs we do, the easier they become, the less detail we need. Are you sure about that? That's my guess. Look, this one here is a manifold change. Easy small job, been signed off and got the part in store. Got Jeff working on that. He's practically an expert. He's been here for ages. Doesn't need detail. Easy win. Fair enough, Barry. You've certainly been here longer than I have. Not really fair enough, actually. It defies belief that the corrosion report was forgotten six months earlier. I mean, that's scary stuff. Now nobody knows about the corrosion, and they're about to fit a new manifold onto what could be corroded pipes. They're also pushing through a series of small jobs, I think, the managers call them quick wins. Work not being reviewed, just being signed off because it already has a few signatures and no detailed drawings or material specs for the work to be carried out, that's unacceptable. It doesn't matter how good the fitter is, it should always have the details. Standards and procedures are slipping and it's slowly becoming the norm here. And I'm afraid to say holes are opening up on our third barrier. You know what you're doing there? What do you reckon? Just wondering. Spike all detail in the paperwork. You reckon I need it? It'd be nice if they gave it, Dan. Mate, they know I don't need detail. This is my job. About the only thing I'm good at. Apart from table tennis. Yeah, it's debatable. I assume you did all the isolations correctly? Yeah, double checked everything. All the paperwork's done, mate. All ready for the change out? You sure that's right, Jeffo? Yes. Doesn't look right to me. Okay. I'll give up. Why? Well, you're going to be attaching that heavy manifold to that rusty main line with that small pipe. Doesn't sit right with me. Mate, check the paperwork. There's eight signatures there. Count them. Eight. That's eight people who know more about this than you and me who've checked, double-checked, triple-checked and signed off on it. So who am I going to listen to, you or all of them? Fellas? Hey, Lisa, what do you reckon of this? You are killing me, H. Going to be attaching this heavy manifold to this rusty main line through this small pipe. Well, does that sound okay to you? You got your permit to work? Yeah. Just the paperwork. Looks okay? 
Design checked and all signed off. Leave the technical stuff to the engineers, Mick. You're the expert. I remember that conversation only too well. Jeff didn't do anything wrong. He followed instructions. He had sign off. Lisa wasn't concerned. I wish she had been a bit more interested. All she wanted to do was make sure everyone had their PPE and safety harnesses in good working order, as per the JSA. And then again, she also saw that the engineers had signed off. I blame myself. I distracted Jeff that day. I was being a bit smart, but you know, I did have my concerns and I should have spoken up and reported those concerns. The reason I didn't? Well, Jeff's a mate. I didn't want to annoy him. To cut a long story short, that was the failure of the fourth barrier. You know, over the next few months, I didn't think about it too much, except every now and then someone would say something, but never report that they thought that the manifold didn't look right, just like I did on the day that Jeff installed it. But they rationalised it. They thought, well, it must be right. We're a safe company. Very low lost time injury rate. Plenty of procedures in place. Signed off by a lot of experts. So nobody reported it. There was no investigation. As it turned out, my instinct was right. It didn't look right because it wasn't right. The modification was badly designed and after a few months of being subject to normal vibrations, hydrocarbons escaped from the pipe. Worse, they reached an ignition source. Two more days and I'll be back at home. Kev's organised a uh, couple of nights in a hotel in the city. Oh, I'm not going to propose, is he? Ah, oh, given up on that idea ages ago. <laughs> Cheryl gave up on me, but I got round to it eventually. I was the lucky one that day. Lisa, not so lucky. You see, Lisa died. At her funeral were grieving parents, a devastated boyfriend, heartbroken sisters, friends and relatives. I couldn't even be there. I was in hospital, still unconscious, unaware of what had happened. And when I woke up and everything was explained to me, well, I sometimes wish I hadn't woken up. You see, I realised that something I did, or more to the point, something I didn't do, contributed to the death of a good friend. So what happened? Well, essentially, all the barriers failed. The holes lined up. It was a one in a million chance, but even low probability things happened eventually. Specifically, the manifold leaked, gas escaped, it ignited, and there was an explosion. And this is the catastrophe that from the day you start your job in this industry, you're told could happen if you don't follow rules and procedures. But to be honest, you never really believe it. Or at least, you think it'll never happen to you. Well, I believe it now. So let's look at where we stand, right here, right now in Australia. The number of gas plants in Australia is set to triple over the next few years, some with new, yet-to-be-seen technology. Some sites are going to undergo simultaneous commissioning, construction and operations. Some assets' lives are being extended, some are being decommissioned. The simple fact is, barriers are breached, uncontrolled hydrocarbon releases continue to occur and sometimes people get injured or the environment affected. Although you often hear about major events overseas like Piper Alpha and Macondo, events do happen in Australia right here in our industry at our workplaces. So who could have intervened? Jeff, the pipe technician who should have known better? Barry, the maintenance supervisor who forgot to lodge the corrosion report? Or Leon, the engineer who had doubts, but in the end agreed to push through the small jobs just to get things done? And then there's his boss, Greg, who with good intentions cut corners to get those jobs done. And what about Ross, the engineering manager who despite reservations proceeded with the transfer of key engineering staff anyway? Was it Anne, our GM, for cutting the budget in the first place? Or was it Lisa? As safety officer, maybe she should have been more diligent or more ready to question Barry's decision. 
Either way, it was her that paid the ultimate price. And of course I should have spoken up when I didn't feel right about the manifold replacement. So how can we avoid this happening again? Well, the answer's obvious. Everyone has a role, whether you're working the tools, making the big decisions, or simply observing what's going on around you. Everyone is responsible for process safety. <laughs>